Good morning and welcome again to Good News Bible Church. My name is Pastor Peter Lightello. We are speaking today uh, the Ministry of Reflection Part 2. Last week we looked at what it means to be blessed with the Ministry of Reflection. Uh, and one of the scripture references that we used was in, out of 2 Corinthians 3, 18, where Paul says, and we who with unveiled faces all reflect the Lord's glory are being transformed into his likeness with ever increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the spirit. That was our main verse last week. Again, and we who with unveiled faces all reflect the Lord's glory are being transformed into his likeness with ever increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the spirit. And the last point we made was that the glory of God is the experience of salvation in Christ, mediated by the Holy Spirit, who leads disciples from justification through sanctification to glorification. Father God, thank you for your word. I pray, Father, that these words that sound uh, theological, uh, do not scare people. I ask you, Lord, to give us clarity as we explain them, as we go through them this morning, and how to make this ministry of reflection applicable in our own lives. Holy Spirit, have your way. Open our eyes and our hearts, I pray, to your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Justification means that we have been made right with God that we are not in enmity with God because of our sin. But we have been justified before him because of Christ's sacrifice and resurrection. Paul said to the church at Rome in his letter, for us who believe in him who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead, he was delivered over to death for our sins and was raised to life for our justification. He says in chapter 5, Verse 16 and 17, again, the gift of God is not like the result of one man's sin. The judgment followed one man and brought condemnation, but the gift followed many trespasses and brought justification. For if by the trespass of one man death reigned through that one man, how much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace, keep this word grace in your thoughts today, those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and of the gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. As we continue in 18 and 19, consequently, just as the result of one trespass was condemnation for all men, so also the result of one act of righteousness was justification that brings life for all men. For just as through the disobedience of one man, the many were made sinners, so also through the obedience of the one man being Christ, the many will be made righteous. And keep in mind God's abundant provision of grace and the gift of righteousness. It's been said, wherein is it possible for us wicked and impious creatures to be justified except in the only Son of God? O oh, sweet reconciliation. O oh, untraceable ministry, O oh, unlooked for blessing, that the wickedness of many should be hidden in one godly and righteous man, and the righteousness of one justify a host of sinners. You see, in justification, we have been forgiven and justified before God through the righteousness of Jesus Christ, which brings about daily sanctification by faith. Now, this sanctification, it's a daily process of being made holy through the work of the Holy Spirit within us. The word sanctification, it means purification, holiness, the effect of consecration. It means the sanctification of the heart and life. It means to be set apart. Paul said to the church at Corinth in his first letter to them, but of him you are in Christ Jesus, who became for us the wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. This is a theme. 
It's a theme, justification, sanctification, glorification. Paul said to the church at Thessalonica in his first letter, chapter 4, verse 3, for this is the will of God, your sanctification, your holiness. This is the will of God that you be set apart. Set apart for him and for his purposes. To be set apart there is a surrender on the part of the one who is being set apart. God does not force a person to be set apart to him and for him. He calls and a person answers and then surrenders their heart. And what then is the process of sanctification? Number one on your outline, the ministry of reflection is the daily process of surrender to the Holy Spirit's governance, which is essential in which in essence, leads to sanctification. Again, the ministry of reflection is the daily process of surrender to the Holy Spirit's governance, as Paul said, be led by the Holy Spirit. For as many as are called to be sons of God are led by the Spirit, which is, in essence, it leads to sanctification. You see, within this process is a dying of self, a dying to the world and a growing affection towards the things of God. The question becomes simple and the answer is revealing. Who or what possesses your heart? Who or what possesses your heart? Jesus in his teachings on the mountain, he said, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroys and, and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where moth and rust do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. What or who possesses your heart? Because that's, that's the whole crux of what it means to surrender daily to the Holy Spirit's governance, lordship in our lives. And that is essential. Surrender is essential to sanctification. In fact, sanctification and surrender are twin engines working together in the ministry of this reflection that we have. And the outcome is for the glory of God, which brings us to another point. Letter A, daily sanctification is a test of a person's love for God because in the ministry of reflection, what you love you grow to resemble. Again, daily sanctification, being set apart, being made holy, is a test of a person's love for God. Because in the ministry of reflection, what you love, you grow to resemble. Then we, again, we go back to the question, who or what possesses our heart? Listen to what Paul says in his second letter to the Thessalonians. He says, but we are bound to give thanks to God always for you, brethren, beloved by the Lord, because God from the beginning chose you for salvation through sanctification by the spirit and belief in the truth to which he called you by our gospel for the obtaining of the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. Everything is right packaged right there in that verse for us to see. We've been chosen for salvation. And in that salvation, there's the being set apart. It's this daily being made holy by the Spirit through faith and belief in the truth of God's Word, which is the gospel, for the obtaining, the goal that we talked about last week, of the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. Peter put it this way. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the pilgrims of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father in sanctification of the Spirit for obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. In other words, the sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ is our justification, which moves us to love God and to obey him in that daily process the Holy Spirit brings us through called sanctification. 
And then Paul back in 1 Thessalonians says that each of you should know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor. So in other words, there's a there's there's God's work that he does in us and then there's our response to that gift, to that love that's expressed in the redemption of Christ on the cross in the gift of the son. And the goal is glorification or entering into the glory of God. Christ in you, Paul says, the hope of glory. The hope of being in the presence of the Lord throughout eternity. The hope of being transformed with glorified bodies and being made in the image of Jesus Christ. It's a profound mystery indeed, but one in which we long for as we wait the return of our Lord Jesus Christ. Again, Paul in Romans chapter 8 says, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. For as many that are governed by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, join heirs with Christ. If indeed we suffer with them, that we may also be glorified together. The word glorified means to exalt, to dignify, and to be in company with. Again, this is a mystery. Paul says it again. Moreover, whom he predestined, these he also called. Whom he called, he also justified. And whom he justified, these he also glorified. 2 Thessalonians 1.10, when he comes in that day to be glorified in his saints and to be admired among all those who believe because our testimony among you was believed, to be glorified in his saints. And we're co-heirs, heirs with Christ. Paul said to the church at Colossae, God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of of glory. When Christ, who is your life, appears, he says, then you also will appear with him in glory, with glorified bodies, in the presence of God throughout eternity. Samuel Rutherford used to say, I wonder many times that ever a child of God should have a sad heart, considering what the Lord is preparing for him. When we shall come home, and enter into the possession of our brother's fair kingdom. And when our heads shall find the weight of the eternal crown of glory, and when we shall look back to the pains and suffering, then shall we see life and sorrow to be less than one step or stride from a prison to glory. And that our little inch of time, suffering is not worthy of our first night's welcome home to heaven. It's also been said, sonship does not exempt from suffering. Sometimes it even causes them, as when we are called to suffer on account of religion, especially in times of persecution. But we need not look for some great thing to bring the text into conformity with daily experience. No, sufferings are small that have power to affect the mind. The strife of tongues, the petty persecutions of home, the long continuance of some chronic disease, the anxiety connected with our occupation may be doing for us what greater trials did for the martyrs. But it's all and in all for the glory of God. You see, one of the things many disciples wrestle with is this Fear that justification and sanctification and glorification is really a reality within their life. It's like, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. I, I know that I'm justified in Christ. I know that you're making me holy. I know that, that in your word it says, in the end, we're going to be glorified with you. But I struggle. Because... What your word says and what is happening in me is two different things. Now, I know there are some disciples that possess a great deal of confidence and they don't struggle like others do. 
If that is you, then this will be a message of great confirmation. But if you are among the numbers of those who feel their failures disqualify them from the blessings of justification, sanctification, and glorification, my prayer is that you will be blessed with great insight into these mysteries and that you will be strengthened today. You see, anxiety, sickness, suffering, or danger, now and then, with a foregoing of the common conveniences and charities of this life may make us pause and cause the spirit to waver and the soul to sink. But let this be only for a moment. All these are nothing when compared with the glory which shall hereafter be revealed in us and for us. So says David Livingston. Eric Liddell says, circumstances may appear to wreck our lives and God's plans, but God is not helpless among the ruins. Our broken lives are not lost or useless. God's love is still working. He comes in and takes the calamity and uses it victoriously, working out his wonderful plan of love. Let me say this again. If you're struggling, you're saying to yourself, I don't see where I'm being made holy every day. I don't see where, where I'm going to, I'm going to make it. I mean, I, I question, Lord, if you even love me. Look at who I am. Look at what I think. Look at what I say. If you're one of those that struggles, listen again. You may be saying God's punishing you because of what you've been going through. You, you may be saying it's my fault. Something's happened here. And, and No, listen. Circumstances may appear to wreck our lives and wreck God's plans, but God is not helpless among the ruins. Our broken lives are not lost or useless. God's love is still working. He comes in and takes the calamity and uses it victoriously, working out his wonderful plan of love. So this brings us to number two, the ministry of reflection as it pertains to a person's sanctification is a continual inward and outward being opposed. Let me say it again. The ministry of reflection as it pertains to a person's sanctification is continually inwardly and outwardly opposed. Opposed outwardly because of the world, the devil, and his fallen angels. St. Anthony says a time is coming when men will go mad. And when they see someone who is not mad, they will attack him saying, you are mad. You are not like us. Let me say this again, because this is, I'm watching the fulfillment of this in my lifetime. St. Anthony says, a time is coming when men will go mad. And when they see someone who is not mad, they will attack him saying, you are mad. You are not like us. Outwardly opposed. Opposed inwardly because disciples have a fallen nature that must be subdued on a daily basis. Furthermore, many people, past and present, have struggled with one of the greatest gifts given by God. But this gift is also one of the greatest mysteries of the gospel. Letter A, many people struggle with the gift of God's amazing grace. They struggle with it. Listen, grace means favor. It means acceptable. Grace as the ultimate salvation. God's forgiving mercy. The gospel is distinguished from the law. Gifts freely bestowed by God. The word grace appears 156 times in the New Testament. In the gospels, it appears only in Luke eight times, in John four times. It also occurs 17 times in the book of Acts. Its highest frequency is used by the Apostle Paul. 24 times the word grace is used in Romans. 10 times in 1 Corinthians. 18 times in 2 Corinthians. 7 times in Galatians. 3 in Philippians. 2 in 1 Thessalonians and Philemon. Ephesians 12 times. Colossians 5. 1 and 2 Timothy and Titus 13 times. Hebrews 8 and 1 Peter 10. Grace is a theme, and people struggle with it. It is amazing. It is a mystery that our God, our King, would die for us. Undeserving as we are, as sinful as we are. 
and he offers grace freely in the person of his son. We don't deserve it. Grace is unmerited favor, undeserved favor of God, and yet we are in a dispensation of grace, of forgiveness. And people struggle with that because we live in a buy and sell mentality. We live in a world that says nothing is free. Well, guess what? Grace is totally, ultimately free. It's God saying, I love you enough. I'm going to save you. I'm going to forgive you. I want you to spend eternity with me. So I'm going to send my son and he's going to die in your place. And, and all the sin of the world is going to be laid upon his shoulders. And he's going to be the ultimate sacrifice. That's my grace. And we struggle with that. Even as believers, even when we accept it, we still at times struggle with it. How can I still be forgiven? Look what I did today. Look what I said. <laughs> Look at how I hurt somebody. Look at how I spoke to God. And yet he still loves me. You see, the, the Greek word for grace is cherish. Or charis. There was a custom in Rome, Roman times, that each year a day was set aside to celebrate the ascension of the emperor to the throne. On that day, he gave from his own purse a bonus to the soldiers. This had nothing to do with their wages they earned. This was the emperor's gift and was called the cherish. The soldiers did not work for it. It came out of the generosity of the emperor's heart. When the Greeks greeting one another, they used to use the word cherish. They began all their letters with the same word. It was a wish, a desire that the other person's life would be filled with good things, favors from the gods that would fill the life with beauty and joy. Also at weddings, when there was a toast, what was said was cherish to you, grace to you. Cherish had no power to implement its wishes. However, when the word was brought into the Christian vocabulary, it was endowed with the power of God. And God does not wish us well. Rather, he effectually works his salvation in our lives. And the word grace takes on a whole different meaning. Within the ministry of reflection, reflecting the Lord's glory in our lives, there are other facets. And to understand justification is extremely important for spiritual maturity and sanctification to take place. Mirrors made of brass are mentioned in the Bible. And what we are looking at next is a great visual reminder of redemption and justification. In Exodus chapter 30, verses 17 through 21, in the New Living Translation paraphrase Bible, it says, Then the Lord said to Moses, Make a bronze wash basin with a bronze stand. Place it between the tabernacle and the altar and fill it with water. Aaron and his sons will wash their hands and feet there. They must wash with water whenever they go into the tabernacle to appear before the Lord and when they approach the altar to burn up their special gifts to the Lord, or they will die. They must always wash their hands and feet or they will die. This is a permanent law for Aaron and his descendants to be observed from generation to generation. In chapter 38, there was a man in verse 8, he made the bronze wash basin and its bronze stand from bronze mirrors donated by the women who served at the entrance of the tabernacle. And it has been said, unlike our looking glasses made of silver glass, which did not come into use till the 13th century, these primitive looking glasses were made chiefly of an alloy of copper, tin, and lead wrought with such admirable skill, it was capable of receiving the highest and most enduring polish. The mirror itself was a round or pear-shaped plate, often encircled with a wreath of leaves or adorned with figures engraved upon the rim. And it was attached to a handle often carved with some elegant form of life. The mirrors of the Hebrew women were brought from Egypt and doubtless of the spoil which the Israelites took from the Egyptians at the time of the Exodus. 
the holiness of God, as it is revealed to us in the face of his son, Jesus Christ, is the best mirror in which to see our own sinful image. The mirror must lead to the laver, the basin, the wash basin, Jewish ceremonial basin. You see, having learned what our true condition is, we must cease to look at ourselves and have recourse to the cleansing bath which God has provided in the gospel for the sinner, conscious of his sin. The fact that the basin, or the laver as it's called, was made of the looking glasses teaches this practical lesson to us. We see our impurity in order that we may apply for cleansing. Our sin is revealed to us for the very purpose of causing us to seek for the beauty of holiness. It has also been said that the laver, the basin, made of the looking glass of the woman, stood in the court of the tabernacle between the altar of burnt offering and the door of the holy place. As the altar removed the legal obstacle that lay in the way of a sinner's access to God, so the basin removed the moral. The one by atonement, which is presented, opened up the way to God. The other by purification, which it affected and qualified the believer for coming into the presence of God. We spoke about that last week. Justification means that curtain was torn in two as Christ gave up his life. And the curtain that separated the holy from the most holy was torn in two for our direct access to God. This writer says, in viewed in this light, what an express, expressive symbol it is of our spiritual fountain opened in the house of David for sin and uncleanliness. The laver in which we are washed becomes the mirror in which we see our own reflection in the mirror of self-complacency in which hitherto we sought to see visions of our own comeliness. Wherefore, to the glory in the flesh is converted into the fountain of life in which the discovery of our own vileness is overborne by the discovery of the surpassing all compensating loveliness of him in whom God sees no iniquity in Jacob and no perverseness in Israel. You see, they applied to the mercy seat, the holy of holies. And what is that mercy seat? Is it not Christ? Is it not the cross? Is it not grace? So what happens when we apply justification, that we've been justified, freely forgiven, that we, we see our sins, we know our sins, but we know also that we stand in the righteousness of Christ. What happens to a person that understands that? Number three, within the ministry of reflection is the grace to comprehend that you are God's workmanship and to also walk in good works. Listen to how this all comes together as Paul speaks to the church at Ephesus. He says, even when we were dead in sins, he has quickened us together in Christ. By grace, we are saved and, have, and has raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Jesus Christ. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourself, it is the gift of God, not of works lest any man should boast. You can't earn it. If you could, you could boast about it, but you can't. It's a gift. But when it's taken by faith, listen to this, when you understand it's by grace you've been saved through faith, then you'll understand that we are his, you are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God has before ordained that you should walk in them. What a profound ministry. Listen to this. Workmanship, the words God works, the words ordained to walk in them. These are words of promise, words from the throne of God. You are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works. You're ordained to walk in them. Isaiah 41.10 in the New American Standard Bible says, Do not fear, 
for I am with you. Do not anxiously look about you, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Surely I will help you. Surely I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Notice the commands, the directives that a disciple is to obey and walk in. We're not to fear. We're not to look around and become anxious, which so many of us do today. We look around and we look at what's going on and we, we get anxious and we get afraid. And our Lord's telling us, no, don't be afraid and stop looking around. Get your eyes back on me. Remember last week? Turn your eyes upon Jesus. And notice the, the, the Lord's promises. I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you. And then we see this fulfilled in one person as an example of what God can do with all of us. In Luke, when Jesus was teaching, he was teaching by the Sea of Galilee, right by the boats, right by Peter's boat. He said, when he had finished speaking, he said to Peter, put out into deep water and let down the nets for a catch. And Peter answered, Master, we've worked hard all night, haven't caught anything. But because you say so, I will let down the nets. When they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sing. It was a miracle. It was an absolute crazy, insane miracle. If you've seen the video series called The Chosen, you will see this miracle. It's amazing how they do it. And you can't help but get caught up in the wonder of it all. And here's this miracle of fish. And it says, when Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, go away from me, my Lord, depart from me, Lord. I am a sinful man. I'm a wicked man. Here's Peter in the presence of deity, in the presence of the living God incarnate in Christ Jesus. You, you've got purity, ultimate purity, and in, in incarnate purity and in, in the sinfulness of man. And they meet together in this amazing miracle. And the only thing Peter does is he just sees his sin in light of God's glory. And that's a good thing to recognize our place, to recognize who we really are. It says, For he and all his companions were astonished at the catch of fish that they had taken. So were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners. But listen, look at what Jesus said to Peter. Don't be afraid. When did he say that? He said it back to Isaiah. Do not fear. I am with you. Don't be afraid. From now on, you will catch men. So they pulled their boats up on shore, left everything and followed him. Matthew puts it this way. From that time on, Jesus began to preach, repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. As Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon and Peter, and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will make you fishers of men. I will make you. It's the same experience written in a different way, but Put them together and you hear the Lord say to a man that's broken because of his sinfulness. He's broken because he knows he's, he's weak and he, he's broken because he's being called and he feels he's unworthy. And, and the Lord does this amazing miracle and becomes Lord of Peter's occupation. Does something that Peter couldn't do. And they all there are witnesses of this miracle. And, you, and in the midst of of incarnate purity, you got man crying out saying, depart from me, I'm wicked, I can't follow you, I can't do what you want me to do, I know you're calling me, I know you want me to follow you, but I can't do this. And what does the Lord say? Don't be afraid, I will make you. Don't look around, don't be anxious, I am your God, I will strengthen you. I will help you. Surely I will uphold you with my righteous hand. 
You see, the I will make you and all the other I will promises were fulfilled when something supernatural happened. In that supernatural event, people were changed. I mean, really changed, supernaturally changed. They were different. In fact, they became possessed with something otherworldly. What made all the difference in this world was that he, the Holy Spirit, came from out of this world because he was the fulfillment of a promise. And the disciples were given specific directives and they followed through and God followed through. In Acts chapter 1, 3 through 5, it says, He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised. When you have heard me, what, what you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days, you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And they were. 120 people waiting around, praying together, searching their hearts. And all of a sudden, the day of Pentecost came. And they were filled with the Holy Spirit. But not just them. There was another 3,000 people that also repented and professed faith in Jesus Christ. And they were filled with the Holy Spirit. And then you had add another 2,000 people to that. And then you had John the Baptist's disciples, and then you had some Samaritan believers, and then you had some Gentile believers. They had the same experience. What was this experience about? It was the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity. And you speak about him and people get paranoid, but no, he is, he is God. And he takes up resonance in our hearts. And then just like the 120 and the 3,000 and the 5,000 and everyone else that's prayed and anticipated, the Holy Spirit enters. And the Holy Spirit creates change. And it just doesn't happen once. He fills us over and over and over again. Because we can't contain the glory of God in this earthen vessel. We can't contain it all. Even Jesus said, I'll fill you like rivers of living water. They'll flow out of your belly. They'll flow out of your life. You can't contain it all. You see, I think the thing that sometimes we don't rely on, and it's not a thing, it's the person of the Holy Spirit. He does the work of sanctification. He gives the gifts according to his will. You see, we place him like on, on the third string of the football team. He's the third string quarterback. No, he's God. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the Trinity. And when a person understands their position in Christ, and then in view of God's amazing mercy and grace, and with the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, they will fulfill the will of God in their lifetime. And when grace and obedience meet, and this obedience really, it's just the response of our love. It's our love responding to the grace of God and it becomes obedience. And when they meet together, then that person will be able to do all things in Christ Jesus who strengthens them. And it is when Christ strengthens a person that they will not go where a well-worn path has been made. They will go where there is no path and they will leave a trail behind them. I want to read the lyrics to a song called Come Now by Mac Brock. Very powerful words. It says this, there's a holy expectation for what you're about to do. Full of awe and adoration, we wait for you. We wait for you. There's a people at the altar. What we offer you will use. Would you breathe on this surrender? We're here for you. We're here for you. Come now, Spirit of God. Stir in our hearts. Light up revival. Oh, Spirit, come have your way. Rain down heavenly flame. Here in this place, unleash your power. Oh, Spirit, come have your way. Let this be a generation set apart for more of you. That we be known for who we worship. 
We live for you. We live for you. And then the bridge. I don't want to miss what you're doing, where you're moving, where you're leading. Holy God, you have all of my attention. I don't want to miss when you're speaking, who you're reaching, who you're healing. Holy God, you have all my attention. Come now, Spirit of God. Stir in our hearts, light up revival. Oh, Spirit, come have your way. Rain down heavenly flame here in this place. Unleash your power. Oh, Spirit, come have your way. Don't fear. Stop looking around. I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you. God wants to do some amazing things in you. Understand redemption. Understand grace. And when grace and obedience, which is a loving response to his grace, when those two things meet together, you become a trailblazer. You will make a difference. You may think, how can that be? It's amazing what God can do with a surrendered people, with the people that are willing to be governed by the Holy Spirit. Think about that as we go into communion this morning. You think about how this all came about, this gospel story. It came about when Jesus gave his life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever would believe in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. And as Jesus was with his disciples, celebrating Passover for the last time physically on this earth, when he had finished, he took bread and he broke. He broke it and he said, take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. At that moment, Jesus let these disciples know, I am the lamb. I don't think they understood it at that point. But he's the bread that came down from heaven. The bread of life. He said, take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Given for you. Let those words sink in. Look at that. Look at that piece of bread that you're holding. It's symbolic of Jesus. And Jesus says, this is given, my life. I gave it for you. I gave it so I could make you. I gave it so my life so I could forgive you and make you an image bearer to give you the ministry of reflection. Receive it. Receive this grace. Partake together right now. In the same way, in the same way he took the cup and he gave thanks and he presented it. He said, take, drink, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant. And it's given for the remission, for the forgiveness of sins. Again, his body's given. His blood is given. He is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He is that Passover Lamb that the death angel had to pass over every single home that had the blood of a lamb on the lentils and doorposts. Death passes over when we apply by faith the, Christ, the blood of Christ into our lives. Death for a Christian is really graduation day. You're just passing over. And Jesus said, take, drink, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, the new testament given for you.
as you look at this cup, symbolic of our Lord's blood that was spilled on the cross. Remember, it was spilled on the cross so that you would be forgiven, so that he could make you. So he could make you in his image. His workmanship and strengthen you and enable you to fulfill good works. And it's all by grace. Look at that cup. Look at that blood. You didn't earn it. It's a gift. You could never earn it. It was a gift. And it's a reminder of that gift. Let's partake together. Father God, thank you. Thank you that you died for us. Thank you, Lord, that you forgive everyone that calls upon your name. I thank you, Lord, that you loved us enough to send your son. You loved us enough to save us even when we were dead in our sins. Lord, there are many people still dead in their sins. They're still not understanding, yet you die for them. There are some people that curse you, that they put their fist to, the, to you. They say they don't need you. They say they can do things on their own. They hate you because they lost a family member or something bad has happened. But Lord God, you still love. You still died because you want to make them. You want to strengthen them. You want to forgive them. I thank you, Father, that you break us. I thank you for that story of Peter. May we have glimpses of your holiness that breaks us, makes us dependent upon you. I thank you, Father, for the institution, the ordinance of the Lord's Supper that helps us, that reminds us of this great, amazing gift of grace. I understand, Lord, that I probably will never understand until I get home fully the ministry and mystery of your grace. But I thank you, Father, that by faith, we can believe even when we don't understand the full mystery. And I thank you that you work with us you partner with us. You call us friends. Help us, I pray, Lord. Come now, Spirit of God. Dwell in our hearts. Bring us revival, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen.